Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, Hellstone here again, and today we're going to be finishing up with our watching of the documentary How to Win the British Medal of Honor, a documentary by Timeline. Um, it's all about the Victoria Cross. Now, if you haven't seen part one or part two of this series that I've done, make sure to check those out first before continuing on with this video. I'll post links to the, both of those videos, both in the description, and I'll have something pop up above my head right now. And uh, yeah, check those out. Don't forget to check out some of the other videos I have on my channel. Like and subscribe. I've really enjoyed this documentary so far. I've loved learning about the Victoria Cross, as well as all the input that you guys in the comments have given me and all the additional information that I've learned about it. It's just been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been good stuff. And so without further ado, oh, wow. Sorry, just on a side note, I'm seeing myself. See, I haven't had anything going on with the Army so far. If you don't know, I'm in the Army, um, the National Guard. And I haven't had to get a haircut or shave in a while. And uh, yeah, I'm just looking at myself now in the reflection. All right, I'm getting sidetracked. Without further ado, let's hop into things. That night, an eerie silence descended on the bridge. Everyone knew that meant the British holding the North End had finally surrendered. And as a result, the Germans could now turn all their attention to the siege of Osterbeek. What's more, as the British forces grew weaker, the Germans were being reinforced with men and equipment from home. Equipment that included their most formidable battle weapon. The Tiger tank was the king of the German divisions, the biggest armored vehicle they'd ever made. It weighed 57 tons. Its armor plating was four inches thick. The shells it fired were from an 88 millimeter gun. It could blow anything to kingdom come with complete impunity. Those Tiger tanks were just absolute legendary equipment in the Second World War. And just, I don't know, the Germans built their tanks in such a way that, that I don't know, it's, there's a reason why they're so well known and uh, why they're able to take out a lot of the other allied uh, equipment and vehicles and, I don't know, interesting stuff, I guess. And a herd of them was headed straight for Kane's position. On the second day of the siege, a Tiger tank rumbled down the street at the top of that bank over there. Now, Major Kane was down here on this piece of waste ground armed with a Piat gun. The British troops hated these things. It was a botched piece of design. It was heavy, it was ungainly, it was inaccurate, and the shell it fired was virtually useless against all known sorts of German armour. And those were the good things about it. The, uh, the bad thing was trying to cock it. You had to stand on the end like that and then pull it up to tighten the spring, which isn't so bad now because the spring's 60 years old and quite weak. But back then that would often take two guys and then once it was done you had to seat the shell which meant feeding it in like this it's immensely fiddly even today so what it must have been like when you had 50 tons of tiger tank bearing down on you and not thinking about kane managed to load the piat by himself and take up position behind a little hut He waited for the tiger to be 30 yards away, took aim, and fired. It was a good shot. The shell went right underneath the tank and blew up, causing no damage whatsoever. All it did was alert the crew inside to the fact that he was there. A shell from the tank's 88mm gun blew the hut to smithereens, but at the last second, Kane grabbed his Piat gun and ran for cover past the tank's machine gun to a laundry. Now, once he got there, he reloaded the Piat and got ready to fire it again. The second shot was as good as the first, but the effect was exactly the same as well. Nothing. So the tank turned its gun again and fired again. And this time it killed Kane's spotter, Lieutenant Ian Meikler. Now, at this point, a sane man would have gone. All right. Now, I, I should point this out again. And I mentioned this in part one of this video. It's so interesting to me to see. I think Jeremy's just standing there where it happened. If I'm understanding that right, he's actually where that was going on. 
and it's just a peaceful little house at that point. But imagine 60, 70 years ago, all that craziness was going on, and now it's just quiet and peaceful and calm. That's always so interesting to me uh, when you stand at a, a battlefield where some horrible stuff was going on, and then currently it's calm and quiet. I've always found that very interesting. Got out of there. But you've got to remember, Cain had lost a hundred of his men by this stage. He wasn't in the mood for getting out. So, as the dust cleared, no one could quite believe their eyes. Because he was lying in completely open ground, facing down a tiger tank. I was close enough to see exactly what happened. I think he altered his position to kneeling. And we can see in the distance, uh, a tank. I was absolutely certain he, he was going to die there. Kept on shouting, load, load, and firing at the tank. He fired for a third time, and this time his shell hit the tiger's only Achilles heel. He blew one of its tracks off, immobilizing it. And you could see the track of the tank come away and lob on its sides. Cain had no time to celebrate, though, because almost immediately another tiger rolled into view on the road up there. He dived behind the wall of the laundry again, reloaded his piat again, and then stepped out to take a shot at it. But he pulled the trigger a fraction of a second too soon. So the shell clipped the wall of the laundry and blew up just a few feet in front of his face. There was a flash, and he immediately fell over. And it was horrifying. When I got to him, his face was black, but totally black, and with little pike of spots of blood all the way around. What, 30, 40, 50, whatever it was. And uh, he was saying, I'm blind, I'm blind, I can't see. So several of his men carried him away to the cops, 10, 15 yards away. I stayed with him no more than six or seven paces, I shouldn't think, holding his hand. It seemed like he was finished. But 45 minutes later, he was back. His sight had returned, and that was enough. The shrapnel wounds he would cope with. And this chap came out of the copse with his face blackened. And he got down immediately on the pier gum. I was staggered, utterly staggered. I thought, well, he must be a very brave man to be knocked out, probably, and then come back and take up the same position. Right, if he wanted to, he could have, I'm sure, said, all right, I'm done, and could have gotten the rest of that fight off, so to speak, but instead he went back. That's very impressive, very honorable stuff. And still hit tanks. I couldn't understand why such a brave man didn't say well I've had enough he'd done his lot and still kept going going but it was still far when we left by the end of that day day two of the siege Kane according to eyewitnesses had destroyed three tanks no one had ever done that before he had begun to win his VC <laughs> This lump of bronze is only big enough to produce 80 more medals. But there's no need to panic about it running out just yet, because over the years it's become harder and harder to win a Victoria Cross. In the early days, simply whirling your sword at a heathen was often enough, but that changed toward the end of the First World War, and the figures back this up. In World War I, 634 medals were awarded, but in World War II, that dropped to just 182. The bar had been raised to an almost impossible height. During the Arnhem battle, a glider pilot called Lieutenant Mike Dornsey found himself defending a sector very close to where Robert Kane was. Here's the report. Uh, it says the position was continually attacked by superior forces of enemy tanks and infantry. On three occasions, the enemy overran the sector, necessitating a counterattack. Dormsey led each sortie with such determination that the positions were regained with heavy loss to the enemy. 
In the face of heavy small arms and mortar fire, he personally attacked machine gun posts with complete disregard for his own safety. The next day, uh, the Germans attacked again with uh, tanks and self-propelled guns. This time, Dornsey lost the sight of one eye. In spite of the pain, though, he refused to be evacuated. And then on the next day, they came back with tanks again. His men withdrew, and he was left alone, facing down a tank. He threw a gammon bomb through its hatch and blew it up. Now, for this, he was recommended for a VC, but they turned him down. That's how hard it had become to win one. Since the end of the Second World War to the present day, only 11 VCs have been won. And this creates a problem. The fewer VC winners there are, the greater the burden of living in its spotlight. Right, I imagine... And you guys are who are from the United Kingdom or any of the Commonwealth places, I imagine if somebody gets that, then they become sort of very well known, like a national hero, I would imagine. Like, would they get press coverage? Would they get, I don't know. It seems like it would be difficult to have a private life once you win that. And I, I, I don't know, me personally, I would prefer a private life not to be in the spotlight. So I don't know. Tell me about that if you know about it. I'd soon have that with me the pals, my buddies, my comrades back with me, rather than any medal. In 1951, Private William Speakman was part of a battalion of the Black Watch Regiment defending a hilltop in Korea. The hill was attacked by 6,000 Chinese soldiers, and with the Black Watch troops outnumbered by 12 to 1, the situation looked bleak. But, as the hill was about to be overrun, Speakman appeared like a six-foot-four-inch human grenade launcher. And I thought, well, all this stuff has been done. We've pried them. I, I might as well use the bloody things, you know. So, uh, that's it. And we went up there and we, we just did it. Ten times he went back for more grenades. And then when they ran out, he lobbed beer bottles and ration tins at the Chinese. Anything he could get his hands on. Eventually the attack was broken and Speakman was a hero, but he found it hard to cope with the attention the VC brought. He told one reporter that the medal made him feel like a freak in a freak show. Sometimes it gets a little bit too much. Not sometimes, a lot of the time it gets too much. You, um, people try, try to do something for you. They try to say thank you in their own little way. They say, well, tell me what happened. You, you just... You either don't want to, or you just sometimes you just say, well, no, it's, uh, I've forgotten all about it now. And that's the truth. It's a bit overwhelming for an ordinary person. The difficulty with the Victoria Cross, or uh, an award of that standing being awarded, is you, you were just beginning to get over the shock and the horror of what you've been through. And then you're given this award and you have to relive it all over again, probably for the rest of your life, because people will be asking you about it for the rest of your life. They're just incredible people. Uh, I'm being soft about them, because they, they were tough men <laughs> that day. <laughs> but uh, I've... I've you know, when I first started, um, being involved with the association, there were 450 alive, and now there are only 15. So there's been a lot of sadness. Um, but I've, we've had some incredible times together. The last two VCs, both posthumous, were won in the Falklands War 21 years ago. And the reason it's been such a long time is quite straightforward. Modern warfare with remote control weapon systems arguably separates you from the enemy in a way that hasn't happened in past wars. It gives you an idea of how really you can justify a VC and how uh, infrequently the opportunity, and it does need an opportunity, the opportunity to win a VC comes past your door. The days of soldiers sticking their heads above the parapet and taking out half the enemy with nothing but a fruit knife are gone. The days of soldiers like this man, Gurkha rifleman Lackeyman Gurung. 
Yeah, I've uh, in the last video I did, I talked about how I need to do a video on the Gurkhas, and that is coming out. But so many people told me some great stories about these guys, and I don't know, they just seem. I don't, I, I'm excited to react to a video about them. They seem like really honorable warriors. In Burma, on May the 13th, 1945, Gurung was manning the most forward post of his platoon when 200 Japanese soldiers attacked the position. Grenades were thrown into his trench, which Rifleman Gurung snatched up and threw back. Unfortunately, the third grenade exploded in his hand, blowing off his fingers, shattering his right arm and severely wounding him in the face, body and right leg. For the next four hours, wave after wave of fanatical attacks were thrown in by the enemy and all were repulsed. Even though Gurung, alone in his trench, had to load and fire his rifle using only his left hand. Wow. Of the 87 enemy dead counted in the vicinity after the battle, 31 lay in front of Gurung's position. 31. So, is the greatest medal in the world in danger of becoming extinct? Will those seven in the safe at Hancock's jewelers ever be engraved? I think it would be quite wrong uh, to say that uh, there will never be an opportunity for a Victoria Cross to be won in future warfare. There will be opportunities. There will always be personal braveries in an intensive operation, a long drawn out operation, that deserves that reward. There would be certainly plenty in this generation who would be candidates for being awarded the Victoria Cross. Courage isn't lost from mankind. It's just, just the circumstances. Back on the banks of the Rhine, Major Robert Kane was into the third day of the siege of Osterbeek and the Germans had changed their tactics. Possibly fed up with losing so many tanks, they decided to batter the British into submission with constant shelling and mortar fire. The Germans by this stage had ringed the British positions with a hundred artillery guns along with 12 of the dreaded Nebelwerfers, multi-barreled mortars which fired six bombs at a time. Somehow this bombardment seemed to inspire Kane, driving him to ever greater feats of bravery. While most of the troops kept their heads down and their fingers crossed, hoping a shell wouldn't land on them, he went in search of tanks. Witnesses spoke of a madman running through a hailstorm of fire in these very streets with his trousers torn off, blood pouring from wounds in his legs, firing his piet at tank after tank after tank. And they said he's falling, the, some were saying he's falling in the pit from the hip, like a bloody cowboy. There was this figure, wounded, bandaged, dirty, dishevelled, but still coming round, still wherever the point of danger was, still encouraging the men all the time. Some were saying he'd knock four, five, six tanks out. Yeah, you can put yourself in the Germans' position and say, whoever's knocking out these tanks must be, <laughs> well... So someone out of this world, I say. <laughs> in his diary, he says his feet felt like they had a thousand pins sticking in them and that his socks filled with blood. Later in the day, he says he felt something hot and sticky running down the side of his face. Turns out he'd fired so many shells, one of his eardrums had burst. He wow. disregarded his own wounds. He was wounded, seriously wounded and bleeding and, and torn to shreds, yet... Uh, he fought on because that was his duty. He refused to go back for medical treatment until there was a lull in the battle. He fought with a total focus on what he was meant to be doing, and many VC holders have this sense of focus. They, they have a focus that sees that it clearly what they've got to do, and they must do that regardless of the effect it has on his own life. And this selflessness is perhaps the, mo the key issue in winning a VC. To understand just how important this business of selflessness is, you need to know the story of John Cruikshank. Cruikshank was the captain of a Catalina flying boat, which was very badly shot up during a suicidal attack on a U-boat. 
Although he sank the U-boat, one of his crew was killed, three others injured, and Cruikshank himself was hit 72 times, including wounds to both lungs. So there he is, with his lungs hemorrhaging, slipping in and out of consciousness, and barely able to breathe. But he was determined to bring the wounded crew home safely, so he kept the plane in the air for an hour until the sea conditions were safe enough for a landing. And that's an amazing story. But it's not as amazing as what the Secretary of State has written here. He says, I think that the VC has been earned in this case, although an element of self-preservation enters into it. And that's the tricky bit. You see, if you're the captain of an aeroplane, you bring it back and therefore save the lives of everyone on board. You also save your own life. You can't really win. Arnhem was a lost cause too. There were so many wounded British soldiers by the fourth day of the siege that the Germans sportingly arranged a ceasefire so they could be evacuated. Kane could have gone. He was a wreck. He was half blind, he was half deaf, his legs were perforated with machine gun and shrapnel wounds. But he chose to stay, and that meant he was still here on the fifth day of the siege. This, in the Germans' eyes, was doomsday, the day when they'd mount their biggest push. They threw everything at the British. Tanks, artillery, flamethrowers, mortars, the lot. The British had arrived in Arnhem with supplies for three days. This was their ninth and the fifth in the hell of Oosterbeek. It was shaping up to be the shortest firefight in history. But Major Kane had other ideas. Kane found himself down by the church and pretty soon he was out of ammunition for his Piat, so he switched to a mortar like this. Now, the idea of a mortar is that you jam it into the ground, you drop the shell into the tube, it fires up in the air and lands on the German positions. But the Germans were so close that he was firing it like this, like a normal gun. Now, imagine what that must have looked like from a German's point of view. This man with his trousers blown off, caked in blood, with sticky stuff coming down the side of his face, firing a mortar horizontally at you. It must have been unnerving. I would have been scared if I ever saw that coming at me. My goodness. In Kane's VC citation, it says of the events of that day, by a skillful use of this weapon and his daring leadership of the few men still under his command, he completely demoralized the enemy, who, after an engagement lasting more than three hours, withdrew in disorder. Robert Kane had turned the tide in the battle, and this is another vital factor in winning a Victoria Cross. Your actions have to create a ripple effect. They have to help save the day. On the Monday, it was the final day of the battle, and the Germans, that was 9th SS Panzer Division, had been trying for since the Friday to break Major Kane's block because that was the key to cutting us off from the, the whole division off from the river, and we would have been finished. We all knew that. I mean, it was obvious to us all, but he made sure that they didn't get through um, to his great credit. His action had tremendous impact on the troops as a whole and probably uh, helped them keep their resolve and help win the battle out of proportion to the size of his own personal command. It was the most wonderful example to everyone. A major firing at tanks is, is something you don't hear of, really. We all wanted to emulate him, of course, um, which we tried to do to our best ability. The, the effect that uh, Major Robert Kane had on the men was obviously his leadership and the fact that they were on the defensive, but he was moving, he was uh, showing himself, he was rallying where there was the greatest danger, and that has the most uh, huge impact upon people who have just got to stay there and endure and be brave. They need something to focus upon. He was that focus. He led by example completely. I mean, I'm sure that... 
who ever got back over that river of the South Staffords could owe that fact to Bob Kane. Nobody else, because it was his example that rallied them. His bravery was suicidal and utterly selfless. His tank-killing antics rallied the troops, beat off the enemy and helped keep the defences at Osterbake intact. These were the reasons why this man won a Victoria Cross. And not just any VC either. According to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Derek McCarty, it was the finest Victoria Cross of the whole war. Well, I could certainly believe that just hearing this guy's story and all that he did. And I, I think more than just that fifth day, the actual advent that got him the Victoria Cross, the days previous to that is just amazing that he was able to continue fighting that long, that ferociously. I don't know, it all sums up in the end, I guess. After the Germans withdrew, the British, out of ammo, food and ideas, and knowing by this stage that the Second Army wasn't coming, silently crossed the river at night to safety. Kane knew they were retreating, but he didn't want to look beaten. When they were in utter defeat by the river, withdrawing over the river, the battle was lost. He found a razor and somehow he shaved so that at least he would go back looking respectable and like an officer above his men, amazing man. Kane was awarded his Victoria Cross at Buckingham Palace on the 2nd of November, 1944, the first Manxman ever to get one. But like many other VC winners, he was never very comfortable with all the ballyhoo and fuss. Kane was the only one of five VC winners at Arnhem who lived to tell the tale. Not that he would tell the tale, of course. VC winners rarely do. And that's a pity, because Kane's tale is one of how many more young men, how many more teenage soldiers might have died had he not fought quite so ferociously. Right, you think about the effect that he had on other people. Um, for example, that one tank that he blew the treads out of, I mean, what if that tank had continued on its way? How many people would it have killed? And so the butterfly effect of his actions is just, we can never actually know, but it's pretty, pretty amazing to actually think about. After the war, he left the army and went back to working for Shell in Nigeria and the Far East. He died of cancer in 1974. Sadly, that meant I never met him, which is a shame for two reasons. Firstly, because I'm absolutely fascinated by VC winners. And secondly, because I'm married to his daughter. She didn't even Whoa. know he'd won a Victoria Cross until after he died. He never thought to mention it. <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> whoa, 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 hold on. So Jeremy is married to that guy's daughter. All right. Well, I did not see that coming at all. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that's amazing. And even more that his own daughter didn't even know he had won the Victoria Cross. And that goes back to the humility that these guys must have. And I don't imagine they want to be in the spotlight. Nobody ever really wants that. And so, I, I wow, I, hold on. Is this the end? I think this is the end of the documentary. Give it a second, see if anything else starts popping up. I think this is it. Yeah, yeah okay. You but, know, we've a rather warped sense of what constitutes bravery these days. I mean, even David Beckham is called a hero for scoring a penalty. But when you look at VC winners and hear their stories, well, enough said. All right, you guys. Well, I think this is the end of the video. Let's talk about this briefly. Um, All right, so I really enjoyed that documentary. That was probably one of the best documentaries I've seen in a very, very long time, uh, especially because it's a topic that I was very unfamiliar with. And so learning about the Victoria Cross and what it means to win a Victoria Cross and about the soldiers who won it has just been something really great that I've very much appreciated. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. That was just such a great do- documentary. It was it was a lot of fun to watch. I, that twist ending, I, man, I'm still thinking about that ending. That's something. Um, yeah, if you if you guys want to, go ahead and feel free to check out some of the other videos I have on my channel. Um, like and subscribe. It helps me out a ton. I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>